Halukhach Sondach. Loosely translated, Happy Sunday, and I just thought I'd branch out from the usual hello. Our Bible reading today is taken from James chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. It would be great if you pushed pause on this video now and went and read through that passage and then kept it in front of you uh, for the sermon this morning. Now, after reading that passage of Scripture, you will be in no doubt what the theme and subject matter of this message is. It's all about words, about speech, and about the way that we use our tongues. But what we need to see is the totality of the message of James chapter 3. Uh, he's not just giving us three ideas for the way that we use our words. He's not a mother or father standing at the front door yelling out at his children that they need to speak nicely and they need to stop fighting. Uh, James is a deeply changed person because of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he desires for his brothers and sisters in Christ to also be deeply changed people. And really what he is getting at is whether or not our speech is spoken by nature or by the grace that we have received from the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, James is not simply talking about morality. He's not talking just about having a positive tongue. He exposes the heart for what it is and then shows us the remedy. So I hope that as you listen along this morning, as you follow along in your Bibles, you'll allow God's Word and God's Spirit to do just that, to expose your heart. And I hope that as we work through this, as much as there are many things that we can feel guilty about, that we should feel guilty about, and that we should confess to God, there is also great hope and encouragement provided in this part of the scriptures for those of us, which is probably all of us, who struggle when it comes to our words and our speech and our tongues. So with that as our introduction, let's dive right in and have a closer look at what James chapter 3 says. Firstly, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and 2, speaks about the significance of the tongue. And it's significant because of the effect and the role that they play on the direction and the destination of a person's life. James opens this section by talking to teachers. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly and then he begins to open it up in verse 2. We all stumble in many ways, and anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. Earlier on in chapter 2, verse 12, James said that we are to speak and to act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty, under the message of the gospel. And so those who teach need to be incredibly careful with what they teach and how they teach and the way they teach because by their words they will be judged and their words have a profound effect and I think he uses teachers here particularly to illustrate that words have a profound effect on where people will end up for all eternity. Remember that's what's on James's heart. He is concerned about the eternal well-being the eternal souls of those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And he, in verse 2, sort of begins to already open up and gives us a little glimpse that there is hope here for the person who fails, that we all stumble in many ways, and yet anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. They are complete. They are, in James's uh, vocabulary, growing up into maturity. And they're able to keep their whole body in check. So there is some hope here. And, and what we need to see at the outset, what's on James's heart, because it's on God's heart, is that God is interested in your final destination. He's interested in the point that you are going to get to. And words, perhaps more than anything else in this whole world, will have that effect. Now we need to push pause. Just don't actually push pause, but just push pause on this passage for a second, and we just need to back up and look at the whole of the Bible. Because although we're looking forward to eternity, we mustn't forget where we've come from. 
Where we've come from, let's go right back to the beginning of the Bible, is that God is a speaking God. In the beginning, God created. And how did he create? He created by word. He created by speaking. It was by speech that he brought the whole universe and the whole world and all of the created order into existence. That's how God works. In the Garden of Eden, he gave Adam and Eve a word, a word that they were to obey, a word that they were to live by. Now they chose not to listen to that word, to disobey that word, and to follow their own desires and to go their own way. And so they plunged all of history into the state that it's currently in because of a refusal to listen and obey God's word. Now it's interesting because God then goes about, and now we're really just fast forwarding, skipping chapters. If you have a DVD, remember those things? Skip chapters. We're jumping chapters right the way ahead. God speaks, he reveals himself through his word throughout the Old Testament. But then we arrive in the New Testament. And in John chapter 1, we read about the word. The word who became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word who uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. God uh, saves this world through his word and through the word. He redeems the world through a word. And Jesus comes as the word, proclaiming a word, a saving message of salvation. Now what we need to understand is that part of being created in the image of God is the ability to speak and communicate and to have words and to use words. And so part of what James is beginning to unearth in us is what is the uh, state of your image bearing of God in your life? Your words tell you whether or not the image of God in you is broken and fractured or whether or not it has been recreated and made whole. Our nature, broken and fractured image of God. When God's grace comes into our life, that image uh, is recreated and made whole and given to us again through the death and resurrection and ascension and the ultimate glorification of Jesus Christ. And so what James is beginning to unpack here is that words have a profound effect upon our life and your words actually operate as a window into your heart and into your soul to show up what state uh, the, your image bearing is in terms of its relationship with God. So let's go on. We've seen the significance of words in verses 1 and 2. We've seen a biblical theology of words very briefly. And now verses 3 and 4, uh, 3 to 6 in fact. James talks about uh, the power and the control of this small thing, the tongue, and the way that it is able uh, to guide and direct towards the destination, the whole being. A couple of illustrations. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. A small young child, you've seen it, walking up the green belts in Constantia. These little children riding on horseback, and they're controlling this massive beast through a small bit that's in the mouth of this horse. Or take a great ship, for example. Although they're so large and they're driven by strong winds, how are they steered? Well, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So here you have it. You have these small things that control the direction of a much greater thing and of the whole thing. Now it's interesting because there's still the rider who's holding the bit, controlling the horse. There's the captain who's holding the rudder, who is uh, steering the ship. And yet what James is wanting to bring out is a tongue, though incredibly small, sitting behind these white picket fences, or maybe kind of slightly yellow picket fences, uh, they need a new painting, uh, is able to have a huge impact on who we are as people, on what we are like as people, and on what we do with other people, to other people. 
Uh, James is mindful that the, the captain, the writer, the speaker is able to uh, control the direction and the destination upon which they're traveling if they're able to control the tongue. The tongue, verse 5, is a small part of the body, and yet it makes great boasts. Uh, here we have this picture uh, of Yes, the power of the tongue, and it can be used in wonderfully constructive ways, but it can also be used in horribly destructive ways, in ways that are random and dangerous. Think about a home that can be torn apart uh, by the words of a mother or a father or a teenager or a child. Uh, the, 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 the discontent uh, that can abide in a set of relationships because of words that are spoken, words that aren't spoken to give life or to speak truth, but to tear down and to break apart. The tongue, verse six, is a great, is also a fire. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and it sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Here James is painting for us this picture uh, of the immeasurable uh, value uh, that a tongue can have for good, but also for harm. Uh, and again, he's trying to get us to move things aside, to look deeply within our hearts and to ask ourselves, what is it that the way that we speak and the words that we choose to use, or sometimes the words that we don't choose to use, what does it say about our hearts? Now notice that when you get to this point, you might start to think, hey, silence is golden. The best thing that I could do is just never ever to speak again. But bearing in mind that part of what James has in mind here is uh, the way that we communicate. There are many things that we can communicate by saying nothing at all. In fact, sometimes we can communicate more by saying nothing at all. Uh, we can withhold words. God didn't withhold his word when we rebelled against him. Rather, he sent his word into the world in order to save the world. James isn't saying don't ever speak again. He's spoken in chapter 1 about how the person who is able to bridle their tongue, they are practicing true religion. And that, yes, we should be uh, quick to uh, listen and slow to speak, but we should still speak, even though we should be slow at arriving at the point where we do utter our words. So don't think that this passage is saying, hey, just don't ever speak. You know, guys, if you're the non-communicative type, uh, this is not licensed for you just not to say anything. Uh, when your wife or your children or someone is desperate for you to provide uh, words of encouragement and words of life. He's not saying to withhold your words, but he's saying that when your words do come out, what are they coming out as? Are they coming out in a way that reflects God's image, God's likeness, and God's character? Do they reflect the words that Jesus would say or speak to people, or do they reflect something else? And that gets us into our next section, which is the inconsistency of our tongues. Verse 7 to 12. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures, they've been tamed, and they've been, they have been tamed by mankind. Think about what we've done even in the 2,000 years since uh, this was written and how we have been able to create so much as human beings. We've been able to put people on the moon. We've been able to uh, circumnavigate the globe. We, all kinds of things. Nuclear power, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Now we're getting into renewable energy. Let's just stop there. But the world has been tamed by humanity. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. No human being can tame the tongue. That's a pretty hopeless statement. We're come, gonna come back to it in a second. It's a, it's a poison uh, that just permeates the being. With the tongue, James goes on, and here's that inconsistency. We praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. So there it is. James brings in that God's likeness. They've been made in God's image. We praise God and we curse human beings. Out of the same mouth comes both praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. This forked tongue, this double-mindedness, this way that we speak about God and the way that we speak about others, is, it's incongruous. It's inconsistent. It doesn't work. There is a problem 
if that is the way that you or I speak, you or me, I'm not sure. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear frigs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Jesus says, Mark chapter 7, that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever it is that is coming out of your mouth is what is really going on inside of your heart. If we speak words of aggression, words of destruction, words of discouragement, words of neg negativity, words that are not the truth, words that are lies, words that are deceit, those reveal the nature that comes out from within the heart, and they reveal a sinful nature. If we speak words of life, and of truth, and of grace, and of comfort, well, then we speak as those who have been transformed by God's life-giving grace. Now bear in mind, I'm not talking about us having to be positive speakers, because sometimes the truth has to be negative. I'm mindful that in so many of my sermons, I, I preach and confront uh, sin and judgment because it would not be loving for me to just be positive and tell everybody and tell myself, hey, you're fine, you're doing good, you're doing great, just keep going. Because sometimes uh, positive speak, if it's only ever positive speak, can be an unloving way to speak. Because God, in His Word, regularly warns of coming judgments and our need for rescue. So let's go back to verse 8, okay? The Bible doesn't contradict itself. It says, no human being can tame the tongue. So what hope do I have? If no human being can tame the tongue, where am I left in all of this? Well, James carries on in chapter 3 and verse 13. So we've seen the, the, the significance of our words, the power of our words to control the whole. We've seen the insignificance of our words. I hope that now you will see with me the salvation of our words. Chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by their deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, it is unspiritual, it is demonic. Who is the wise person? Now you might begin to think, hey, how do we get from words and speech and tongue to wisdom? Uh, if you go and look through the book of Proverbs, and I'll put some of the verses in the description of this video below, Proverbs and wisdom has so much to say about our words. And basically, what James is helping us to see is that when our words and our tongues are completely out of control, we are not operating from a place of wisdom. And if we're not operating from a place of wisdom, Proverbs 3 uh, tells us, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we're not operating from a place of wisdom, we're not operating in the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is one of the ways that the Bible talks about having a right relationship with God, of being in a right relationship with God. So if wisdom is not operating in our lives, and if wisdom is not operating in our words and our speech, then it tells us that our relationship with God is broken or it is dysfunctional. And that is, remember, that's the cry of James. He wants our relationship with God to be true. We learned last week about uh, true faith and false faith. Now we're looking at wise words and foolish words because God is concerned about the direction of our life because he's concerned about the destination that we are going to arrive at. So although our words do not save us, they certainly um, reveal the condition of our souls and the salvation of our souls. So that's what's going on. So who is wise and understanding among you? Well, wisdom shows itself. It shows itself by the good life, uh, by deeds that are done in humility. This is what flows out of the truly uh, wise person. Proverbs tells us that, that though wisdom costs you everything, you should uh, get wisdom. And so wisdom isn't so much something that we speak about. It's not just knowledge. 
It's the way uh, that we conduct ourselves in the way that we live our life in the fear of the Lord, mindful that everything that we do ought to flow from our relationship with Him. That means that everything that we speak needs to flow from our relationship with Him. So if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it. Do not deny the truth. These are unwise words. These are all ways that we could speak. And this wisdom, it doesn't come down from heaven, but it's earthly, it's unspiritual, it's demonic. Do you remember what James said about our tongues being set on fire by hell? Our whole life becomes set on fire by hell when our words are out of control. When our words are used for destruction, when our words are inconsistent, and on the one hand we praise God with our mouths, and then on the other hand, in the next day, we, we are cursing humans who are made in God's likeness. And this brings together this whole thing about that law of liberty, that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our mind and all of our soul and all of our strength, and we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we are uh, on the one hand, saying that we love God, and on the other, cursing our neighbor, well, can you see how that just doesn't work? It just doesn't come together. This wisdom, it is from this world. This wisdom is, not, is unspiritual. It is not true religion. It is demonic. And it is seen in our actions, which we looked at last week, and it is seen in our words and the way that we speak. You see, we can't sit back and say, um, I didn't murder, I didn't commit adultery, I didn't do this and this and this. And yet we mouth off with uncontrolled tongues, wreaking havoc in people's lives and destroying relationships and maybe even destroying them. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The way that we speak shows us, tells us, shows other people and tells other people whether or not we truly love God. Verse 16, for where you have envy, and remember this is the salvation of your words, for wherever you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. We can use our words uh, for envy, for selfish ambition, to spread disorder. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, so here's the, here's the, the contrast, a tongue that's set on fire by hell, and burns down a forest or a city or a mountain, or a tongue that is set on fire by heaven itself. The wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, and it's peace-loving, and it is considerate, and it is submissive, and it is full of mercy and good fruit. It is impartial and sincere, and peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. James chapter 3, verse 8. No man, no woman, can control their tongue. So then who can? Well, only God can. Only the Spirit of God residing in us can enable us to keep a tight rein on our tongue and so practice pure religion. Uh, only wisdom that God gives us that comes down from heaven that we obtain through reading God's Word through the Spirit dwelling in us, through looking deeply into the Word of God that gives life and not life and not forgetting it, uh, like a man who looks in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what he has seen. Uh, this is where this wisdom comes from. God is the source of this wisdom that we so desperately need in order to get control of our tongues. But it's not just about the morality of getting control of our tongues. Remember, it dives down much deeper. It exposes the heart. This is what we need for a changed and a transformed heart. And the reason that we need a changed and a transformed heart, not just so that we can control our tongues in this life, we need a changed and transformed heart because that is what plots the course of our life. That is what sets us on the direction towards heaven and the destination that God is preparing for those who love Him and for those who call upon His name. How do we call upon His name? Well, we call upon His name 
with our words. So here this wisdom is. You can say here this word is. Our words then, are they pure? Our word, are they peace-loving? Are they considerate? Are they submissive? Are they full of mercy and good fruits? Are they impartial and sincere? Peacemakers who sow in peace, they reap a harvest of righteousness. What are your words sowing out into this world? What are they sowing out into your life? What are they sowing out into other people's lives? Are your words life-giving words? Are your words war words of warning to those who might be lost? Are they words of salvation? Are they words of appreciation? Are they words of encouragement? Are they the words that God has spoken to you as he has called you and drawn you to himself? Uh, will the words that God speaks to you uh, be the words that you speak to this world, to your wife, to your children, to your parents, to your family members? You see, this is why God is so concerned, so desperately concerned about our words, why James is so desperately concerned about our words. Yes, they can uh, bring uh, great destruction of relationships, but more than that, they can destroy us. And so until our hearts are transformed by this wisdom that comes down from above, our words will always wreak havoc wherever they go. And the direction and the destination of our life will be the fires of hell. But when God breaks into our life, when he breaks into our heart, when he gives us that new heart and his spirit that comes and dwells in us, and we look carefully at his word that gives life, we will begin to emulate him. That image will be restored and we will stop speaking by nature and we will start speaking as those who have received God's grace and those who are full of God's grace. So yes, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, by all means, watch your words carefully. Watch your life and watch your conduct, but not because of what's happening on the surface, but because of what is going on deep inside your heart. What's coming out is what's really happening in there. So let me ask you this morning, what's happening inside your heart today that is revealing itself as it comes out in the words that you are speaking and putting out into this world? Would you bow with me and let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us to keep a tight rein on our tongue, and we pray, Lord, that that would be true because our hearts have been set afire by wisdom that comes from above, by heavenly wisdom. Father, you have said that if any should lack wisdom, they should ask you for that wisdom, James chapter one. And so Father, we ask you for wisdom from above, uh, for our life, for our works and our deeds, but especially this morning, Lord, for our words. May our words reveal a right and true relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.